All right, for this next panel, Insurance Innovation in the Age of Data. Our Matt Wong will be moderating again. Uh, we have Sarah Street from Excel Catlin. Uh, her role spans innovation across both Excel's independent venture capital activities at Excel Innovate uh, and various strategy innovation activities at Excel Catlin. Uh, Sarah is also, uh, uh, or Insurance Business America, recently added her on the 2017 Hot 100 list of movers and shakers in the insurance industry. We're also joined by Deb Sundahl. Uh, Deb is Senior VP of Innovation at United Health Group, where she pursues next generation growth uh, from new initiatives that reimagine the way healthcare is delivered, as I mentioned, Matt Long. Please help me welcome them up. Um, so yeah, let's just get right off the bat here. Um, Deb, you know, I think uh, uh, on everybody's mind, obviously, is, is the recent election and with that, you know, what's going to happen to the ACA. Um, you know, people are expecting, I think I had expected possible repeal legislation as soon as February, but now maybe a little later than that. But, you know, as you think about that inside of United Health um, and what sort of the possible effects of that legislation, you know, might be, how does that impact you know, where you're driving resources from an innovation standpoint and, and what are you sort of doubling down on now or, or maybe stepping away from? Right, so um, I, I won't speculate on the election and the effect of the election, um, but what I will say is that healthcare is continually changing. So uh, the policy landscape is just one of those areas um, and, and a very important area, but as are um, many others. So when we look at machine learning and what's happening in that space, as we look at even just the chronic conditions and how our population within the United States and across the world is changing, uh, it, there's tremendous change and there has been for some, quite some time. So I think we're all now focused on the undercurrents of uh, the undercurrents of change as it pertains to policy, and that's incredibly important. Um, but as are many of the others that have come and are, are also existing that have been talked in this uh, talked about in this conference. So our company as a whole, uh, we have over 230,000 employees. We are focused both on the insurance side from a health benefits perspective, but also on the health services side. And I think it's a really unique blend uh, because what it allows us to do is partner with many, many types of groups. So we partner at the state and federal level um, because so much of our health insurance is also um, uh, um, uh, uh, government health insurance. Um, in addition, we partner with unlikely uh, partners, startups and, uh, and nonprofits. And I, I think what's so important is every single person in this room has an incredible uh, uh, and an incredible and an effective and a good healthcare experience most likely but you also probably have a story or two to tell about yourself or a loved one and a family member um, that maybe wasn't a great experience. And what's so interesting about being able to look at the data um, that's accessible within United is that our innovations are focused significantly on the problems. So the first thing that I will say to you is we acknowledge the problems exist in the healthcare system and they need fixing. And they are way too big and massive and too important to all of us, both professionally and personally, to not collaborate across unlikely partnerships. And so, yes, um, policy helps move that needle. It helps change how healthcare is delivered, as does um, our changing uh, demographic and population and pieces. So whether it be access to care or wide variation that we see in the United States around cost and quality, whether it be engagement and how do we as consumers get it, um, engaged in our own health care. Many of these different problems we're seeing in our data, we're seeing um, in natural experiences with our members, and we're focused on all of those, um, including the policy changes that really can help us make a better health care system for the United States and then globally. Great. And, and Sarah, you know, there's been a lot of new startups on the PNC side. Uh, especially going after distribution, uh, you know, in different ways. You, you, I think Excel has invested in a company called Lemonade, and there's a lot of corporate venture now investing in, uh, in insurance firms who are investing in startups. So how does Excel, you know, when it comes to distribution, startups who are selling um, insurance and, and building that, you know, customer relationship um, with, with, with consumers, how, how does Excel identify, you know, the startups it wants to invest in and, and work with um, given sort of the influx of different startups now in, well, the, in the market. Well, uh, firstly, good morning, everybody. 
Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, I think the first thing I'd like to sort of say is we uh, very much um, are embracing uh, all of the uh, new activity that's taking place uh, within our industry. Uh, I mean, we recognize uh, a need to innovate. Uh, and uh, certainly for me, there were a couple of statistics I saw back in 2014 that really made me realize that unless the, uh, and I'm property and casualty, global reinsurance, so different from what Deb does, uh, but a real need that if we didn't innovate, we were going to become irrelevant. Uh, and those statistics were one, if you looked at the percentage growth of uh, nominal GDP in the world back in 2014, it was 4.3. And if you looked at the growth of uh, global premiums in the insurance industry, it was three and a half, something like that. Uh, so the global economy was growing much faster than the insurance sector was, which showed that over time, if we didn't start to fix this, we would become irrelevant. Uh, the second statistic, which is actually was even more glaring, was if you looked back 20 years ago uh, at the market capitalization of the S&P 500, uh, about 80% of the value was represented by physical assets on companies' balance sheets. So that's plants and property, uh, buildings, tangible assets that insurance companies had decades and decades worth of data that we could analyze and we were very, very comfortable underwriting the risk on. Fast forward 20 years, that has complete, completely flipped. Today, only 20% of the market cap it's represented by those tangible assets sitting on companies' balance sheets. The 80% is made up of intangibles. It's brands, it's IP, it's patents. It's all those types of assets that currently the PNC insurance companies are not providing risk solutions to our clients. So if we don't come up with ways to actually uh, innovate, uh, uh, somebody else will. Uh, and uh, we will become irrelevant. So the PNC industry has a sort of a really interesting challenge ahead of itself. And there's no doubt that we need help. So we have very much embraced uh, uh, all of the activity uh, in our sector uh, because I actually believe that Excel Catlin is probably one of the more innovative companies within the, the PNC space. Uh, it's in our DNA. Uh, but if I look at it as a crit as a cr with a critical eye, I think we're very good at marginal innovation. I don't think we're very good at transformational uh, innovation. Uh, and as anybody in this room who work works for a big company knows, it's really hard to innovate internally uh, and do those transformational. Uh, so we are really, really interested and excited, not sort of at all... Uh, head in the sand around what's going on. We really want to engage uh, with that. Uh, and that is very much why we have a number of sort of uh, innovation initiatives uh, within Excel, uh, particularly Excel Innovate, which is the venture, it is an independent uh, venture capital firm that we sponsored and launched uh, that is making investments and working with startups. Uh, and sort of at a granular level, uh, we're obviously, just like any venture capital activity, looking for smart entrepreneurs and management teams. Uh, we're looking for scalable businesses uh, because at the end of the day, to make venture capital pay, it has to be scalable. You have to have sort of, because uh, you're going to have a bunch of things that don't work, so you have to have your successes as being sort of big successes. Uh, and whilst we don't require that it is something that is in line with Excel Catlin's core business, I think we've come to realize that uh, where we can add the most value uh, to our uh, portfolio investments and partners is through areas which Excel is involved in. Because uh, we have the expertise of the individuals within Excel Innovate, but if we can bring the 7,000 other people that we have within the broader uh, company uh, to help uh, solve problems, share insights, share knowledge, that actually we can be a much more value-added uh, VC uh, investor and not just be sort of the cheapest money uh, there. So uh, I think uh, whilst we have done things, I mean, Lemonade, which we can talk about more later, uh, is not something, we're not in the personal lines business. Uh, uh, so we will do things that aren't. 
uh, when we find really interesting things that we think we can learn from. Uh, I think over time we'll find more and more of things we're looking to where we can we can bring our bigger expertise to the table. So just to follow up on that, uh, you know, you mentioned Lemonade, which is a company uh, that is going after sort of a larger part of the stack, you know, as a, as a carrier uh, license and, and looking to expand uh, in homeowners and renters insurance. Um, you know, it, it going, looking specifically at Lemonade, what, what do you think the major opportunity is for a company like that? What, what, will this have a, a broader impact on, on the industry, as, as yeah. a lot of people are talking about? Well, clearly, yes, because we've uh, invested in it. Uh, we think it's a great. Uh, I'm always a little hesitant, to be honest, to talk about Lemonade, uh, only because uh, uh, the CEO, uh, uh, Daniel Schreiber, is so articulate. Uh, and uh, even if I sort of uh, practiced and looking in the mirror and practiced it 100,000 times, I would never be anywhere near as articulate as uh, Daniel in terms of trying to describe uh, uh, what Lemonade's all about. Uh, but as you said, it's a, it's a new insurance company. It's trying to address a number of what they perceive as being current cha challenges with the current insurance model. Uh, and that is both uh, high expenses uh, and customer experience. So on the customer experience side, uh, they have very much focused on making buying insurance fun. Uh, most of us don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, I'm really looking forward to buying my insurance policy today. Uh, so they've tried to really simplify the process and they're using chat box in terms of mayor is at the front end. And then more importantly, because I think there's been quite a lot of developments already on that front mm -hmm. across the industry, but they're using chat box on the back end in terms of claims uh, and uh, uh, their chat box, uh, AL uh, Jim, uh, was very proud of himself last week uh, because he settled a claim in less than seven seconds. Uh, and so a customer uh, uh, submitted a claim. Uh, uh, Jim went off and uh, pulled up the policy, did 19 fraud checks, uh, and then issued a, an instruction to the bank to settle the claim and send the notification. Uh, that is going to be game-changing for the insurance business because... Let's face it, as consumers, we all want things better, smarter, quicker. Yeah. Uh, when you start getting insurance policies issued within two minutes and claims settled uh, as quickly as that, that does definitely change the customer experience. And then the other aspect of the Lemonade model uh, is that that's the customer experience front. It's also the reduction in the cost. Uh, and that's not only from being able to build an insurance company without legacy systems and infrastructure, uh, which allows them to have a model which doesn't have the 30, 40% expense ratios that the traditional uh, insurance carriers have. Uh, and secondly, they're also going after improving the loss ratio. Uh, and that's through using behavioral science and looking at how people think about their insurance companies uh, and trying to, uh, I could talk about it for hours and I won't, uh, but it's very interesting in terms of uh, trying to change how people think about their insurance company because there are certainly surveys that have been done that says that 25% of people in the U.S., are very comfortable embellishing their insurance claims. So that means one in four people uh, are happy to almost do insurance fraud. Uh, there's a fine line between embellishment and fraud. Uh, that costs the industry a lot. Uh, so by trying to change the dynamics between the relationship between the insurance company and their clients through different business models, uh, we think is very interesting and we, it'll be interesting to see how it, how it plays out. Great, and, and Deb, similarly on, on, on the health side, we have also seen um, you know, a few startups who are also going after sort of that full stack approach. You know, Oscar Health comes to mind. There's others who are going after sort of the Medicare Advantage market. Um, do, are there, and using sort of data as a differentiator, or at least you know, thinking about that. Is there, do you see pitfalls for startups who are trying to do that, especially as some of the models start to shift when we think about healthcare moving forward? And, and you know, uh, do you see uh, you know, opportunity on, on the, that front for, for startups to really try to break through in, in terms of a, a 
model there in healthcare? How does United sort of think about that? Yeah, it, it's a packed question. And I think what's, in, what's important is that uh, the partnerships are the key. So um, Oscar and other health insurers were constantly, as an industry, trying to look at how do, we, how do we remodel care? How do we remodel that experience? And I think what's interesting of, of we have many, many partnerships. So I'll tell you a story of how all is, all does, does all of this work together, both from an insurance side, because I, in, in earlier panels, there were qu questions around what gets reimbursed, what doesn't, why is it that way? Um, and then how do we partner with, uh, with, with companies who are adding more personalized data? So just from a data perspective of what we have today, and I'll, I'll actually read it to you because it's pretty massive. So just today alone, United Health Group uh, covers over 80 million medical lives, uh, 170 million uh, lines of claim data, resulting in 250 million clinical and administrative. So when you start to boil that down, what does that actually mean? What are we doing on a daily basis? Well, we're interacting with 8 billion lab results a year, 4 billion determinations, as well as 3 billion medical procedures. So already we're starting. So when you say data and the p potential to do machine learning, and, um, and to really change how healthcare is delivered today. It's staggering. So we have Optum Labs. And what Optum Labs is, is, uh, it, it is a, a group that's partnering with Mayo Clinic, and they're looking at, our, at that data set and saying, what could we do in the natural progression of disease? So we partner with academic institutions. We partner with med other medical institutions. And one of the projects is around Alzheimer's. And so as we look at that data and start to be able to see from, a, from a, um, a predictive analytics perspective, what are the biomarkers and what are the indicators in this massive data set um, that, that potentially could keep our loved ones from getting Alzheimer's? That's real work that's happening today within United. Um, but I think what's also important is once we know that, what do we do? And what do we do with that? And, and how do we actually help treat? Uh, and so we also go into research from the medical delivery side as well. Um, and so a, a great example, and I think you were talking about partnerships and, um, and, this, and the startup and what is the role. I'll, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time to talk to you about a particular story that's one of our big success stories, but so critical and it what it does is it really illustrates how United, such a huge company, approaches at disrupting our own selves. And so innovation is, is one of our values. Um, it is every single person who is hired to the company is called to innovate. So what does that actually mean? So we have the business side where they're doing that constant uh, improvement on existing products, but we also have robust R&D cells across the organization. So that might be venture groups. It might be groups like ours that are really focused on medical um, and uh, behavioral. And then we also have technology. And so there's this team of teams approach where we are keeping things outside of the business um, uh, until we can incubate it and help. And I think earlier on one of the panels, we saw this, you know, what is the experience of startups? So I came to United 11 years ago as a part of a startup. So I have personally experienced this, um, that euphoria of getting bought. Uh, and then what does that actually mean? And where do those products go? And how does it actually evolve? And when we say hockey stick of growth, so we can have the most elegant, um, well-positioned startups who have no idea what it means when we say scale. Um, it, they may be able to scale for a hospital system, they, but they do not know what it means to turn on a dime to sell to massive numbers of large employers and then to need to be able to deliver that across the country and sometimes across the world. So what we do is we partner with those startups. So let's just start with the policy question in the beginning with the diabetes prevention program. So 79 million Americans today um, and growing have prediabetes. So if you look to the left and you look to the right, one in three of those 79 million Americans will become diabetic. Our healthcare system was built to respond to acute care. If you broke a leg, you went in, you paid for that service, you got it fixed, and you went home. The healthcare system today was not built to respond and help manage 79 million prediabetics and keep them from coming in the back door of diabetes. So how do we respond to that? How do we pay for that? So we partnered with the CDC, and we said, wow, our government has put in massive amounts of dollars of research, and lo and behold, we have an evidence-based practice called the Diabetes Prevention Program, and it not only 
keeps people from becoming diabetic, but it also, hel also helps people lose weight. So we partnered with, and many other startups also partnered with the CDC to say, how do we roll this out nationally? So first we partnered with Y. And we said, okay, what if we could get the DPP at every single Y in the US? And our role in that was the technolo technology to actually pay for the claim. This was the first wellness intervention that was medically sound enough to be paid for via claim. And I think that's a really important point, and it's a, a very important, because so many people came, come and say, will you pay for, for my Fitbit? Um, will you pay for this device? We will pay for things that are medically proven in the literature um, from an academic perspective. So we built that system where the DPP could now be paid for via claim versus a per member per month charge. But then we say, okay, we still have 79, even though we're the largest distributors of the DPP, we still have 79 million Americans who have prediabetes. What next? So then we partnered with Comcast and we created a reality-based TV series. And we went to the CDC and we said, it's the same exact intervention, but we're going to deliver this um, uh, uh, virtually. And the CDC came back and said, that's great, but we'll only accredit you if this is a proven intervention in the literature. So we partnered with researchers at Northwestern. Um, and this is, uh, yesterday we talked about grittiness. I think so much we want these devices and we want the quick fix, but it is these long five, six year projects that are happening in the R&D space that now with policy change that says, um, uh, there, there's many, many partnerships and I won't go through all of them, but through this, we won an Emmy for, um, for cre uh, filming a reality-based TV series that was able to help a large employer uh, reduce prediabetes in their population. We then went and partnered with a startup of Beachbody, and they are now creating that. And now we have a, mar a product in the market, which is Real Appeal, um, and it's addressed. I, I, I just want to make time for, for, you know, I think uh, the title of the panel is, you know, Insurance Innovation in the Age of Data, and, and so I did want to get to those, some of those before we... I, I think what I would just add, though, is that the intersection of this, what's so critical, is everything that was talked about in the morning, but then also how is that paid for via claim. And so this intersection of the claim is what's critical. Great. Um, so, so Sarah, I mean, lots of PNC insurers, uh, including XL, are, are investing in smart home technology and startups who are, who are in that and, uh, and partnering and also investing. So, you know, to what degree does smart home technology maybe change the underlying need to even have insurance? or um, you know, what will be, when will we start to see real impact in terms of um, smart home technologies impacting you know, the PNC insurance industry and, and how many of, and as the last, you know, the last part of that is how, what, is, what is the privacy angle of that and, and um, are there, you know, for example, devices that just don't pass the muster of, right. of meeting some of those criteria? Well, well, certainly there is a, a lot of activity in the, the home connected sort of sensor space. Uh, and we've been interested in it for a couple of reasons. I mean, we're not a personalized writer, but we did make a, an investment uh, in, a, in a company that does uh, sort of residential sensors uh, because we were interested in learning more about it and thinking about it. Uh, I mean, do I think it will eliminate the need for insurance? No, I don't, because irrespective of everything that you do around loss prevention, uh, disaster still ha still happens, uh, but it will definitely influence insurance, uh, and uh, we think it's a good thing uh, because obviously it can help on loss prevention, and we like to help. I think the industry likes to help or should like to help its customers uh, actually prevent the losses, uh, and in fact, it's something that we've been doing in the commercial space for a long time. Uh, where companies like ourselves, we've had groups of risk engineers that when we go out to do the underwriting of a commercial building, they will make recommendations to our client about things that they should do that would reduce their loss. And then we would take, or potential loss, mm -hmm. we take that into consideration. Uh, so uh, I think the industry will uh, engage with it from that perspective, but then also uh, the data and analytics that come out of it could be very helpful. I mean, for years, uh, insurance carriers have offered uh, consumers discounts for having security alarms in their houses, uh, but we've not known whether those security alarms have ever been switched on or whether they work, uh, and therefore we've been assuming that rational behavior would be the case. With real sensors and with real information, we will now, I think, allow 
It'll allow the industry to be a lot more granular on a consumer-by-consumer consumer basis, offering better terms, offering better coverage, lower deductibles, and ultimately better prices for people who we see have different behavioral aspects. So uh, I think you're going to see we, we, there's a lot of time and energy by particularly the large personal line carriers being put into it. Uh, and I think uh, it'll be a, a great uh, development for the industry. But I, I do ultimately believe that bad things still happen irrespective of everything that you do and basically that's that's the basis of the insurance policy is still to be there to provide the right. protection when it's needed right so before we get to audience q and I am curious to get both of your takes on you know what we've talked a lot about uh, you know, different things on, on the panels in the, in the past few days but what what particular data sets do you think will maybe gain in importance over time both in health and then also on the PNC side that aren't you know necessarily used uh, today in underwriting purposes and, and in other aspects of the business yeah. As, it, as we move from a fee-for-service model into a value-based care model, which is, uh, it's dramatically changing the relationships between all of the players, the, pl the employer, the, the end um, member, as well as the medical provider. It, it's that small data that will continue to grow. So as we've been hearing about devices, and I, we see a huge advancements in the personal wellness data space, small data, but it, it's really um, th the people who have the grittiness to stick it out to figure out what the medical um, small devices are that become FDA approved and are uh, evidence sound that will really make the difference. And it's not just the device. It's the ability that when that physician walks into uh, the room, that regardless of what device you have, you have a single um, translation of that. And then how do you turn uh, care models more into real time? So I'm not dependent on giving you a black box of my data when I come in for my appointment, but yet it's real live time monitoring. And we're doing something, some of that today, even with type one diabetics um, in a children's hospital, uh, where we're changing the model of care. So it's the combination between value-based care, that transition toward value-based care, paying for value versus services, combined with the, the incredible potential of small data and personalized data that's meaningful to the, both the member and the provider and, and, and uh, gets you beyond thinking, uh, a physician thinking of a compliant or non-compliant, but really understanding the behavioral components. Great. So, so I think for us within the, the context of the PNC company, uh, I mean, one, I, sh I should stress, uh, our CEO has made it clear that every business and every function should be looking at data and analytics uh, to improve what we do. Uh, and I thought it was fascinating yesterday listening to Billy Bean and how to sort of take away uh, and then connecting that back to some of the stuff that Janet had talked about uh, on kind of SunDisk and the HR using it. Uh, I think even sort of we would expect our HR department to be using data there. But when it comes to the core sort of what we do is underwriting and it's risk selection. Uh, so that sort of is, is where the most critical data sets are. And we've found that it is, uh, I mean, there's lots and lots of data, but as our head of strategic analytics likes to remind us, it's all about relevant data. And what we've found is it's the data sets that are proxies for the insured behavior, the behavior of the insured, which is the best predictor for us of risk. Uh, and things like prior loss, demographics, financial metrics, those types of things. So I think it is data sets that will allow us to get even more granular and even more accurate uh, in, as proxies of behavior around the insured. That will be uh, the thing I think that we will see, we're, we're certainly focused on uh, in terms of accessing. Great, so I think we left a couple of minutes for audience Q&A, which I think we'll be doing from the back. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience? Yeah, um, we're running a little bit over, so we're just going to ask one quick question. Um, given the influx of funding and interest to insurance startups and digital health startups, um, do you think that these venture capitalists and upstart companies understand the complexity of the business you're in, and are they bringing um, different perspectives uh, by attracting different types of people into the industry? Sarah, do you want to start off? You know, I mean, it's hard for me to make observations about other venture capital firms. Uh, I mean, I would say I feel uh, from the, the Exxon Catlin perspective, we are uh, very privileged to have attracted uh, Tom Hutton uh, to be managing director 
of uh, our venture capital. Uh, he's not only uh, uh, an entrepreneur in himself, he's been an investor, but I mean, he was uh, the uh, original, one of the original founders of RMS, uh, which now is such a critical piece of the uh, property and casualty uh, or the property sort of net cap risk modeling. So he gets it. He knows what uh, it takes to use data and to build a business out of it. He's been in insurance. So uh, we find that uh, that in terms of our di dialogue with entrepreneurs is something that uh, we feel uh, is really, really helpful because uh, not only actually we understand the business, uh, but we can help those uh, venture capital, uh, the, sorry, the entrepreneurs themselves. Because uh, it is a complicated industry. I mean, I've worked at Excel for 16 years. Uh, a good portion of it was, at, most of it was actually, I was on, on the investment side. I was chief investment officer. But I've sat in meetings on insurance for 16 years, and I still only have a scratch of the surface of the knowledge, because it's complicated. It's a whole new jargon. It, it's, uh, so having the industry expertise uh, I think is really, really critical uh, in this particular sector. And Deb, what about on the healthcare side? It, it, there's a lot of investors now investing in a lot of different yeah. parts of the very Bil big healthcare industry. Bil billions, right? And I think what we see is lots of investment really going in this whole connected uh, personalized device space. Um, but I, I think what's important is both from understanding risk pools and understanding from an insurance side, that there's a component, and then also uh, the, the, that grittiness. I think we see that there have been huge advances on the wellness and the prevention side because it's not as hard. It's not regulated by the FDA. Um, you don't necessarily need the, um, the, the medical studies that go along with it so that it can be paid for via claim. And so we see those advancements, but I think if we're really going to make a turn, we're really going to be able to um, help people keep from getting sick. Uh, uh, what we need to do is we need to make those advances and find, uh, first of all, keep it out of the business for a, a bit longer so that we can really ensure that when it's coming into the business, it is ready for that hockey stick of scale. Um, and, and really keep it in that R&D space, but embedded um, uh, within the business framework so that we can continue to involve it and, and get the right publications and align and ensure that we're working um, with the FDA to get approval and ensuring that we have the publications and ensuring that those platforms and the data comes into a place where it's meaningful for the clinician. And so there's just, there are many, many steps. And so the iterations are, are much longer term. And I think yesterday that was talked about as well. So it's the grittiness. And uh, we want to work with, uh, with people who understand that, not necessarily the quick win, but have that stamina to really stick with something um, for three to four to five years before it actually can be scaled within the business. Great. So I think with that, I think we're running a little over time. But um, please give me a hand in, in thanking the panel. Thank you.